Welcome to the Ages of Rock podcast with your hosts, Bill Algie, Dennis Talbot, and Alan Tate. We are three guys who have one thing in common, a love of rock and roll. Our goal is to talk about all things rock. We hope you find this show intriguing, funny, and occasionally highly opinionated. Enjoy. Hey, welcome to Ages of Rock podcast. This is Dennis, and I'm with Alan and with Bill and with a man named Ken. We'll get to him in a second. This is episode 219, and we are joined tonight with Ken Tamplin. How's it going, guys? A extremely busy man. I've been trying to work. I've been working with his uh, girl that, that does all of his handling, and we've been trying to get a date for a long time, but this man is super, super busy. If you don't know who he is and you've not been on the internet very long because he's uh, he pops up in my feed every day. I'm ubiquitous. I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, go ahead, Ken. You, I'll let you explain what you do. We'll just do that I, real quick. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a guy that's trying to figure out what in the heck is going on in the world right now. But other people know me as a vocal coach. I've got, what, 40 records out, 4-0. Uh, I've done a lot of touring. Uh, I've done a lot of music for film and TV. And right now I have a, an, a vocal academy that's doing extraordinary. I teach people how to sing. I've got a lot of vocal knowledge. And, um, you know, I'm just like I said, I'm trying to figure out, you know, we're in a really odd place in our world right now. So I'm trying to figure out how I can keep people happy and singing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of people that had tours this year that are not touring. Yeah. And hopefully now, hopefully they were they're keeping up. Maybe they were talking to you and keeping their keeping their chops up when they're. Yeah, I, I, they're, it's actually kind of been good for a lot of people to come have enough time off to rehabilitate their voices because um, it's rare that they get that much time off. So that's been pretty helpful. And it, with corporate speakers as well, you know, so. Oh, that that's makes cool. sense. Yeah, that's cool. Hmm. All right. So let's just, uh, like I said, this is not an interview. This is more of a conversation, but I kind of went through and was looking at stuff. Let's start kind of just from the from people who don't know you. You started out, you were a guitar player originally, right? Uh-huh. Started yep. Out. Guitar was my first instrument. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, Carlos Santana, John McLaughlin, Jeff Beck, you know, all the guys way back in the early days, right? right. Um, and... I, you know, didn't really take my voice seriously until I was, well, I found out my cousin was Sammy Hagar probably when I was 15, I think, 14, something like that. And I went, wow, my cousin Sammy Hagar, that's kind of cool. How come he can sing and I can't? So I just started, you know, dabbling in it a little bit and started learning about the voice. And before you knew it, over time, you know, I, I realized, hey, I guess I can throw down a note or two. So uh, I started taking a lot of very, very expensive vocal lessons and I've been doing that ever since. Uh, and about tw almost 12 years ago, I started a singing academy that has done very, very well. In fact, um, we're coming up on, I think, like close to 150 million views on my YouTube channel and right around a, um, right around a million subs. We'll probably get that in the next couple months. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. Wow. Uh, you know, it's, and that's one thing that uh, I always find interesting about your voice is, is you know, you, you don't just sing one type of music. You know, you'll one day you'll put out a video and you'll do something like a, you did a Ronnie James Dio uh, little combo thing here, a couple three song trio deal. And I was like, damn, he's, you know, he's hitting it good. And then you did the uh, did the, the uh, old Boston the other day. Right. And, and my buddy was over and I said, let's, let's see him hit that note. Let's see him hit that note. And I was like going. He hit that note, and you know, you're not, you're not a spring chicken. <laughs> believe it or not, yeah, I'm 56, and I've never sung better, but believe it or not, the high notes in that song, though they're difficult, that wasn't the hardest part of the song. The hardest part of the song was, at the end of More Than a Feeling, they use an effect, a reverb effect, where they hang on to the, that note at the very end for a really long time, and I thought, I'm just going to try to sing it. And, I, and it took a chance, too, because it would have destroyed the whole you know, the whole uh, take that I did. But I just went for it and I was able to kind of have enough uh, air in the lung or compress the air enough to make it all the way to the very end of the song. So instead of it being affected, it was actually a real a real live performance. So, Because I would just, I actually just saw somebody here recently kind of took that song and broke it down in the studio. It was one of these guys that talked about guitar work. But they were talking about how that, during that part in that high note, I always thought it was the guitar. I didn't actually know that he was singing that. You know what I'm saying? You, I thought it was the guitar making that note. It's kind of hard to tell. I always thought it was the guitar, uh, you know, faking the note, making it sound like he was sure. singing it too. Was that was that Rick Beato that did that? Probably. I, I think so. And then he had like the he had the the vocals uh, isolated, and then he had the guitar isolated. Right. 
And he was showing how that was. He was basically just going right along with the guitar. Yeah, okay. I'm like, darn, that dude. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that isolated vocal. It's pretty cool. In fact, when I heard that vocal, what was interesting about it is I always just envisioned him singing heavier than that. You know, I didn't realize he sang that light. And so, and then you could really hear, like, he didn't have, doesn't have a lot of support. You know, he didn't have a lot of those, that the kinds of things that I've grown up to know that are critical um, to great singing. So, um, so then that also made sense too, when I saw, I've seen him live a few times and he was never able to, to reduplicate that studio sound, but the whole band was a studio project, you know, it wasn't really a big live thing. So I'd never seen, I was never super stoked with seeing, like, when I've seen Aerosmith, it was like, yeah, you know, and when I saw Boss, I was like, you know, when I saw Kansas, it was like, wow, you know, I, I went home with a musical spanking. But um, <laughs> when I, when I, but when I saw, you know, Boston, they were just barely kind of putting, the, you know, just chicken wire bailing hay or whatever that term is. <laughs> <laughs> Super so, glue and some duct tape. <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, I mean, it's cool. It's Boston. Like, you know, we're all who was inspired by Boston. So. Yeah, there's some older vid. There's some older videos on YouTube. You can see them live. I forgot where it's at. It's one of those larger stadiums, and they're playing. And like you said, it's not. It's not like seeing Kansas live. I mean, Kansas yeah. is just it's a perfection Ridiculous. almost. Ridiculous. I know, but yeah. but you're glad to see it. You know, it's like going they're doing it, but it's not like you said. It's not. You know, it's not you know, like the record. <laughs> think of like live bands because I've seen a lot of bands over the years, and every single time, certain bands that are ju are just amazing would be like. You know, sticks. Holy cow. Every time I've seen them live, it's just like, I am not worthy, <laughs> you know, right? Or or other bands. I mean, Hart and Wilson killing it night after night after night after night. My own cousin, Sammy Hagar, man. I mean, every time I've seen the guy, you know, just so impressed. killing, it, killing so impressed. it every time. And so I just have a, such a high level of respect for bands that just and, – and, and not only are they killing it <clears> – <throat> But it's like I said, Kansas, for example, you know, the, the it's almost like, well, you know, we didn't get to show you what we really wanted to do on the record. So we're going to really show you what we're made of live. You know what I mean? So that's just absolutely incredible. So, yeah, we, we just had the uh, we had them on here about what three or four episodes ago. We had a, a singer, bass player and a guitar player. And and they were talking about how much they enjoy playing live and was talking about, you know, they were the, the, the new album that they just got coming out. They were so excited to be able to play that live. You know, unfortunately, they didn't get to yet yeah. because we were actually going to go see them this summer. They were doing a triple bill and uh, with Foreigner and Europe, right. and they were excited about that, and that got canned. So they were pretty pretty disappointed on that. But, yeah, Kansas yeah. is one of those bands. that And Sticks, I've seen them about four, eh, five times, I guess it was. And they're, like I said, they just never disappoint. You know? Yeah, totally. And, yeah. and Sammy, like you said, Sammy, for what, well, he's 72, I believe, yeah. 72? Yeah. yeah. That dude was singing the other day. They did that uh, right now kind of uh, yeah. video. That his voice is just unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, he's, it never falters. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. have you been giving him you been giving him tips on how to do that then? Yeah. Or? Actually, no. <laughs> you know, he's one of the few guys that have been able to hold on to his voice singing like as a street singer. You know, for me, um, when I was trying to learn the voice, man, I don't know how he was able to squeeze out all those notes, kind of like David Covered, although he's lost his voice over the years, but obviously... Um, but Sam, you know, he was able to hit these E fives all over the place. And when I was growing up, I could barely hit an F sharp four, an octave below that. And it took me a lot of, of singing technology and a lot of training to be able to sing high. And, uh, he just had a naturally gifted belting wailing voice, but he's like the only guy that's hung on to that. Like really look at it. I mean, Steve Walsh has lost his voice. All these guys are gone. Um, even Coverdale, whomever, one of the few guys too, Paul Rogers, Holy cow. Yeah. Every time I've seen him, it's like, oh my gosh, dude, you got to be kidding me, right? He's better now than he's ever been. And he's like, he's 71 too. I mean, he's like up there too, right? Yeah. Paul Rogers is killing it, you know? So anyway, I, yeah, there's very few guys like that. I don't know if Paul's ever taken any, any lessons either, but man, if not, I should take some lessons from him. <laughs> so yeah, it's, cool amazing. Definitely, it's definitely interesting. I mean, I, the first I have, I saw Sammy back years ago well I saw him with Van Halen and it was such a it just wasn't a very good show just the show itself was not very good so I really didn't hadn't seen him for a long time and then two summers ago I saw him um, at a small outdoor venue smaller outdoor venue here in in, in the Indianapolis area and um, it was him in the circle and he just I mean I, I'm telling you I left there going I will go every time he's around I now, mean, what just did you see that Halen wasn't that good. I saw him twice, and both times I, I saw him on the David. It was Rock either, 
Yeah, it was either the it was either the OU812 tour or the Foreign uh, Uncarnal Knowledge tour. It was one of those two because it was just it was all about Sammy changed clothes like 14 times and Eddie was just tra- it was just bad. I mean the, the show it was just a bad show. And it, it was just wasted or something. It was depressing and it was just like I can't believe I'm this is this bad. I really was shocked. Aww. But but when I saw him the last the, two years ago, actually he did, um, it was right before, uh, the Indianapolis 500 and he'd went to the track that day and the guys, some of the r- drivers had asked him if he would stay, um, because I think the show was on Friday and his, and the tra- the race was on Sunday and ask him if he would stay over and do the national anthem. Now they already had somebody, he's telling the story, whatever. And he said, you know, I he, just, he said, I, I'm never going to do that in public and I'm never going to do it like some of these guys do because it's the hardest song ever to sing and no matter what you do it gets in your head and you can't get it right and he said every single time it's just so bad that's funny and then he then, and, you know he goes on about it and whatever and you know the lights go off and he goes what the hell he goes what the fuck i'm gonna do it anyway and <laughs> the lights come on they put a flag behind you know on the on the video screen he sat there and sang it i'm telling you every I, tears Aww. Goosebumps! It was awesome. He did an incredible I've sang, I've job. I've sang that anthem a lot of times, and you know, you're right. It can get in your head. But the interesting thing about the anthem is that a lot of people don't realize is um, Rocket's red glare. The word glare is the same note as uh, um, uh, Land of the Free red, and Rocket's red glare. It's the same note. And so everybody sings Rockets Red Glare and they never have a problem. They get to the, you know, Land of the Free and they blow chunks because they're all freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> and they just got to know that they just sang that same note in the song. It's like, OK, I've done this. You know, I have a funny story. Um, I, I don't really always know who I get when I do a Skype session and I do a lot of them. So, I mean, I'm doing, you know, four five, six hours back to back of sessions every day, sometimes six days a week. And, and so, um, in fact, one of them was, uh, Jenna Talakova. I'm going to get to a different story, but Jenna Talakova. And I'm like, you know, so I, I'm always like getting some weird thing and someone's got some anomaly or problem or something. So this, this hot chick comes up on my screen, look her up, Jenna Talakova, write this down. I hope she doesn't get mad at me for saying this. He, she, um, anyway. And, um, so, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I'm going through some scales and she's telling me she's going to do this TV show in Canada and, and blah, 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 blah. And, and she's saying that she's having trouble hitting some of these high notes. And, and I'm like, I'm going along and we're doing la and I'm going, you know, I know this sounds weird. I didn't know her from Adam. So I didn't know what, you know, who I had in front of me. And so I said, but, um, you have all the lower resonant qualities of a bare tone. I mean, I'm not kidding. And yet your voice can't get down in that range and yet you can't sing the high notes of a soprano. So you're kind of stuck between like a baritone and like a low alto. And I said, I have done a lot of voices over the years, but I've never experienced this before. And she goes, well, I'm actually transgender and they cut my cords in half so that I could speak higher and thought I'd be able to sing higher. And I go, Oh, Oh, It's all coming back to me now. So if you look up, she was Miss Universe, Canada Miss Universe. That's the one that way back when Trump, you know, de- 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 so she was transgender. And so I get weird. To, so I'm going to get back to the story. I bring the, the national anthem. Like, How did you go from national anthem to Jenna Telecom? <laughs> I'm going to get there. So anyway, <laughs> I, so this guy shows up on my screen and his neck has to be this big. And he's tatted from head to toe. Uh, and he's bald. And I mean, the only thing missing was the spike collar and the pit bull, you know, leash behind him. Right. And he, the guy's muscles had muscles. So he's sister and he tells me, so he goes, he goes, yeah, I don't really want to be here, but I don't really have a choice in this. This is my commanding officer. He says, I'm a Lieutenant command, uh, Naval, Naval, Navy seal, Lieutenant commander. And he says, uh, and my commanding officer has commissioned me to sing the national anthem for 3,000 Navy SEALs. I go, I didn't even know there were 3,000 Navy SEALs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah, it's, it's for a big convention. They heard me sing in Haiyang Yang or something in karaoke. And he, you know, he's, you know, commissioned me to sing the anthem. And to be honest, I would rather go on a kill mission with a 30% chance of not making it back than singing the anthem. <laughs> <laughs> really? You tell me. I'm like, oh, great. So, so, so we, we're, as we're talking, I said, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to sing happy birthday. 
And he screamed, ah, you think this is funny? You think this is funny? I'm going to come to that screen. I'm going to kill you. I will find you. You know, I have information. I'll find you. Whatever that is. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> and he's like screaming at me. I'm like, no, 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 no. This, I'm serious. Like, we're going to start with like nursery rhymes. And we're going to start with like ditties and things. He goes, you know, he, he's, I'm blowing his mind. It go be, I go, because you take it too seriously. You take, I mean, we all should take the anthem seriously. I mean, I'd say don't take the anthem seriously, but the way you're approaching this is you just told me you'd rather go on a kill mission with a 30% chance of not making it back than sing the anthem, right? So what we did was we did that and then we migrated it to the Eagles, take it easy, and other sing, sing songy songs that are really not songs we ever take seriously. And eventually got him to the point of seeing the song in a different kind of way where, and then we took it up a full step. He practiced that one. We only had three sessions together. And then he, he a couple, three months later, he uh, emails me back. He goes, I killed it. He goes, I can't, <laughs> you were able to get me to sing this and kill it. But it's because people freak out over the tune. It's just like, you know, the gospel of the U S or something, you know? And so it's, it's an interesting, um, psychological test for a lot of singers, you know? So that's cool. I don't know what you could do with all that information, but at least your podcast. Was no, fun. that's, no, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. What, I mean, that's what I say. This, this is a conversation. This is not, you know, that's what we, we, we just find out what's going on. Um, I do have a question though. When you got people, when people come into your thing, what is the, what is the most common or the worst mistake that, singers make and especially people who think that they know how to sing they come in and what's something that you know they come in and it's like you know right off the bat you're doing this something wrong well that's a big spectrum because i have people at the highest levels i'm not really allowed to talk about who they are but there's like metal guys for example that you know they just kind of they come in and or come in or they're on skype or, or they come um, and they have been doing something the wrong way for so long that they think it's going to continue to bail them out night after night. But I'm trying to explain to them, that's what got you into this mess to begin with. And that's why you're coming to me. So they think that, you know, I don't confuse me with facts and figures. I've already made up my mind. It's like, no, no, no. You know, dude, we've got to like start with support. We've got to have a relaxation response. We've got to open up your throat for open throat technique. We've got to get to your vowels in a way that are accessible rather than you pinching and squeezing and killing yourself. Like someone's taking a vice grip to your throat to get to your notes all night. So we've got to open this up for you, for you to be able to I go, hi. Right. You got to be able to have like this three, four octave range of the stuff you're doing. And you can't go, ah, you know, and expect to get anywhere and not hurt yourself. So, you know, that would be ego getting past ego from from at that level. And then other people that, let's say, you know, just clubbers that have been singing for a long time, breaking a lot of habits, the way they breathe again, the way they access notes, the way they, you know, the body shuts down. Because most of the time, especially, um, you know, pretty much all rock singers always sing at the threshold of their top note. And I don't care if it's John Fogarty or I don't care if it's some guy in a club down the street, you know, they always have to just that hitting that slam of that A4 or that B4 over and over again, you know? And, and so th the way the body works is they're like in this constant state of fight or flight. So everything is just this constant, constant, you know, gotta get that, okay, then I'm playing, gotta get the note again, and, you know, whatever. And the whole goal of this is a relaxation response. If you notice, I, hey! like I'm not, I, I'm not in any sort of tense state when I do that. And I could, here I am, I'm, you know, how long did I just tell you saying six hours going on, you know, seven hours of singing today. And I could just go in my room right now and sing anything I want. Um, it's because I know that everything emanates from a, a diaphragmatic response is strong, abdominal cavity that is strong, a relaxation response to the chest, the neck and the throat, and permission, giving myself get permission to access this stuff with ease rather than feeling like a fight or flight, like my body's got to shut down and I've got to, you know, clamp down and close everything down just to be able to access notes. Interesting. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm, I, I've never been as I've played in bands since I've, I've been in high school, and I've never been a singer. I've just never, I've never felt comfortable singing, and I, I always think that I'm, you know, I just don't like it. Well, this last band that I was in back then, I was like, I was trying to sing a few songs because I'm a big Foo Fighter singer, so we were doing, uh, let's see, Pretender, you know, and I, I could rarely get through the whole song because my my voice would be gone. 
I mean, it would just absolutely just did, be- did you see the, the version I did? Of yes, the okay. I did. And I then did. Gabby's version, right, right. that I did with Gabriella? Yeah, because yeah. because Dave loses his voice all the time. Dave's, I love Dave. He's super awesome. Uh, but, you know, I mean, he's just, just blood-curdling, you know, scream, right. razor blades to the vocal folds, spit it out, kind of blood, blood spitting out vocal kind of guy. But there's a way you can do that. It's called hyperglottal compression, where you actually compress the air. Because the, the without, again, without getting too technical, because I don't know if your fan base is probably going to go, to, oh, okay, next. <laughs> no, no, don't but worry. It, um, that people don't understand. It's the overuse of air that dries out the vocal folds themselves, the cords, and then they become inflamed, so they lose phonation. They become what's called dysphonia. They lose phonation. And when that happens is then you have to ram more air across the cords to get sound to come out. Well, I don't know. I haven't smoked dope since I was 14 years old, but pretend we took a hit off a joint. And here we have this hit, and we're talking to our friends right now. We're trying to hold the hit into our lung, right? That actually is called glottal compression. So as we're compressing the sound, I can take that compression right now, and I can lean into a note. If I if I understand and built um, open throat technique, muscle memory to keep the throat open, so I can go, hey, right, and I can have this um, really heavy distorted response. Notice, like I said, I've been singing all day. I don't say, wow, I'm not hoarse. I'm not choking on myself, right? Because um, I'm compressing air. It's the overuse of air that destroys the vocal folds. So if I can compress the air and get that same response, Dave Grohl, my own cousin Sammy, whoever it is, that distorted tone without hurting my voice, I win. If I don't, I lose. And I probably get vocal folds and I end up in surgery like Steven Tyler. Well, see, that's kind of odd because we, because Alan and I had been working on a project and we were doing some stuff and I had been singing more because my buddy was like, you need to sing. I think you could sing more because he hears me singing along with records. We'll sit out in the garage and we just kind of, you know, have a couple of beers and we'll just be singing. And he's like, man, you, your voice is actually not that bad, you know? So we were doing, we started doing uh, somebody call me a doctor from Van Halen right? and I'm nailing it. And the thing is, I'm not hurting afterwards. I don't yeah. know what I did different. I guess, like you said, maybe I'm. I think with the pretender too, I was so nervous and I was worried. I was playing guitar at the same time and I'm trying to do this and do this. And and I think I'm just tensing up and everything else. This one here, I'm just by myself and having fun with it. That's the whole point. I'm with, and and Again, I, like I said, there's so much of this that is psychological. I'm not saying there isn't a lot that is physical and technical. There absolutely is that you're a vocal athlete, but a lot of people like, you know, well, when I like the old adage, you know, I sing so much better in the shower and it's like, yeah, right, pal, that's because X. Well, actually there's a lot of truth to that. Usually the showers create a lot of heat moisture in the lung and in the folds themselves. So the folds are staying constantly um, lubricated, you know, right? So there's a lot of humidification. So uh, the moisture in the folds themselves gives them the ability to have resiliency. So as you're singing, there's a lot of freedom in it. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason because there's reverb in the room. So you're not having to be dry as a bone when you sing and try to force a sound. You can sing with a lot more freedom. You're a lot more relaxed. You're jovial. No one's listening. You know, there's not all the tension going on. So there's a lot of, of components that go into pl uh, that play into that. But in the end, you know, that is a reason for that too, is this relaxation response, having fun with it, you know, whatever. And, you know, it's also a reason a lot of people drink before they sing too, because it loosens them up. I don't recommend that. A, it's a bad habit. And B, <laughs> after the fourth drink, you think you're singing good, but let me tell you. <laughs> you know? and so, anyway, but yeah. Go to a karaoke bar and you can probably figure that out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Later as the night goes on. It's scary okay, at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> now i, I want to uh, kind of go back to one of the things that dennis said earlier you know he mentioned that he sometimes didn't feel comfortable singing uh do you do anything to help your clients deal with stage fright all the time absolutely believe it or not john bon jovi even said he still has stage fright before he goes on stage he's freaked out it takes him his third song before he kind of gets, you know, comfortable enough to be able to sing, you know, Barbara Streisand said, it doesn't matter what walk of life, you know, people do that. For me, when I, again, this, I don't take this as a, as a, a side of arrogance. It really isn't. I like guitar. It's like, I am so rehearsed and I am so on my game that when I go out on stage, I'm not going out to worry about what notes I'm hitting. I'm going out to entertain people. 
I'm going out to have a good time to entertain people. And I assume Sammy's probably a lot like that too. I don't think he thinks so much about his voice. So he talks about it a lot when he said, oh, I gave it all last night. I'm going to give it to you guys. And that kind of thing. I don't ever, I don't need to do that. But, um, and he's Sammy, I'm not, he's, you know, he's uh, Sammy, you know. But, um, but I will say that um, to be so prepared, overly prepared, so that when you walk out, it's not an issue of, Am I, is it a tightrope walking act where I think I'm going to fall? No, I'm not. I can do it walking backwards with my eyes closed. I, I'm, I'm that rehearsed when I do something. So what I tell people too when they go to sing and, and whatnot is we need to get ourselves to a point where uh, the, 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 the mechanics of the singing and the mechanics of the playing and all that stuff is secondary and second nature to your, your entertaining because people are there. You know, let's be honest. When people come to see a band, they're coming for nostalgia, they're coming from a time in their life when they heard a song that was, you know, back in the pickup truck at some concert somewhere or some girlfriend they had or, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's, it's a nostalgic moment for them. And so they're not expecting, now they're bummed that they duck all the notes and they don't sound good. Yes, of course. But, but they're there to be entertained by someone that, that they love and, and, and respect. Well, very few people are going there with their arms crossed going, okay, is he going to hit a note and I'm going to be, want my money back if they don't. So, you know, that's sort of when, when I share that with my, my, you know, singing uh, comrades or, you know, clients or whatever is they want you to do well. They're excited for you to do well. They're rooting for you to do well. They're there to have a good time. They want you to have a good time with them. So the bigger picture is, did they leave with a smile on their face? Did they have a good time? Not did you hit the one epic note, though that's, you know, it's big. But so prepare so much for that. So when you can get into the space where you're there and you're like in a living room with your friends, having a good time, having a conversation. And that's really what the show should be about. So as we can get our brains around that, that's that's a very important key component. That's, cool. that's a that's a very interesting uh, segue into my next question. <laughs> I want to ask you about. <laughs> um, so my background, you saw the background. Yes. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had an episode where we did. Um, we all selected our favorite one song from our from all of the Kiss catalog. We had a couple other guys on the show. It was lasted four and a half hour. I don't know. It was like, it, was, it wasn't four hours. <laughs> it lasted forever. It felt like four hours. <laughs> it was a long time. We had a great time. But um, so I'm going through and I'm picking songs and I get to Carnival of Souls, which is one of my favorite records. Right. And I pick I Confess and um, I'm looking at it and I pull it up on I uh, pull it up on Wikipedia and I'm looking at, you know, the writers. And I'm like, holy shit, we're going to have him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about that. How did you hook up with Gene for that? Well, that was an interesting thing. Um, so I, when I I was in a Christian band called, by the way. I'm a Christian. I make no apologies for that. But I think it's ridiculous that we make Christian music in a Christian bubble and this and that, whatever. We just make music. You know, people like it. Cool. I agree. You know, so um, but at the time, you know, I convinced myself that I was going to save the world. And uh, so I was doing this Christian band and uh, it was miserable. The Christian label stole all the money. The other Christian publishing company stole all the money. We're working our brains out, killing ourselves, touring, making our own MTV videos, paying for it ourselves, you know, but with the tour money that we had. And um, so I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was like, OK, I just need to like just do music for the sake of music. Now, some of you may or may not know, you know, yeah, the management for Motley Crue said, hey, Ken, would you consider taking the band? You know, when Vince Neil left the band, uh, same thing happened with the band, except, you know, when Udo Dirk Snyder left the band and said, hey, you know, Ken, I flew over to Dirk, Dieter Dirk's studio, the producer of the Scorpions. And, you know, and it didn't work out because. I realized Foreigner, same thing. Um, you know, Kevin Jones, Mick Jones's brother said, hey, would you come try out for Foreigner? You know, Peter Frampton, same thing, asked me to, to do Peter Frampton stuff. There is, so there's a lifestyle that I'd been on enough tours with enough bands and all the drugs, and I finally got myself out of drugs, and I even quit drinking over a year ago, um, alcohol, because it was just consuming me, and I just go, hey, I'm, you know, this is not good. Um, so, but I know my propensity towards things. I'm going to get to your answer to your question in a minute, but it was a backstory to this, mm-hmm. how I met him. Um, so... Um, I, I just couldn't see myself in the lifestyle that a lot of these bands were living, especially the Motley Crue's and, you know, uh, some of the bands. I mean, you know, when I when I did the Accept gig, I mean, no offense, but like eight o'clock in the morning, Jack Daniels was, was brought out to the breakfast table. I'm like, and then, you know, other bands, co- Lines of Cocaine, that was breakfast. I'm like, you know, and then you know, there's the debauchery and just a lot of stuff that was going with it. And I'm, you know, married, married guy trying to hold his family together out on the road with these guys. 
And and I did do, you know, in fact, I got kicked out of rehearsal room one time uh, when Hutchins had just died in excess. And they brought me out in L.A. at SIR Studios to do uh, this kind of cattle call rehearsal thing. And I got the gig. And but I said, you know, hey, I've got two young kids at home. Same thing would have with Journey. But two young kids at home. And I said, um, you know, I, I, I can tour for like a month at a time, but I'm not going to go out for like six months like you guys do seven, eight months. And, and the tour manager said to me, he goes, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. We're only going to do three week dates, one month dates, you know, no problem. And I, I agreed to do the gig. And so then I, when I got the tour schedule, it was six months out of the country it was the first leg of the tour. And I said, we just discussed that I couldn't do this. And he goes, F you, welcome to show business. <laughs> and, I, and I made this stupid comment, no wonder Hutchins offed himself if he had a manager like you. And then wow. they basically threw me out <laughs> of here. And I just, you know, it was a very uh, uns- insensitive comment to make. But so was his. But, um, you know, so getting back to the Gene Simmons thing. So I had, I was in this Christian band uh, called Shout. And then I did another band with um, my other guitar mate, Lanny Cordola, who was in um, House of Lords at the time. And I was my old guitar teacher. We did Jafria and, and Vanilla Fudge and some other stuff. And then we also had uh, Chuck Wright, who was in Quiet Riot, and um, you know all these different. Ken Mary, who was in Alice Cooper's band. So we did this band together called Magdalen, signed by this label. <laughs> you know, remember that? And um, anyway, great album. Uh, Mick Kozowski, in fact, helped co-produce the album. You probably know him because he did like Get Lucky and all the the uh, what's it, the Grammy he just won uh, not that long ago. Um, Daft Punk, you know. Uh, Punk, yeah. But Mick was like zillions of albums, crazy albums before that. In fact, I got to tell you a quick mix story. Remind me to tell you a funny mix story because you'll get a kick out of this. And this is back in this this time. So anyway, um, and I, I just wanted to get out of this Christian music thing. And I just went, guys, I'm sorry. I just can't do this anymore. I just got to go live life as a human being and stop sitting in this bubble. And so I had I had just finished the Axe to Grind album um, with a song on it called Living for My Lord of All Things. And I get this call from Gene. And Gene goes, yo, Ken, it's Gene Simmons. And we get, wait a minute, doesn't KISS stand for like kids in Satan service? Oh, no, you know, I'm kidding. Um, anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so he goes, you know, I want you to come down and I'd like to uh, talk to you about, you know, this, this song I just heard. And I said, okay, cool. You know, um, he said, I'd like to put a band together with you with this guitar player you got named Scott Van Zen, which Scott is amazing. I mean, amazing yeah. guitar player. And so he goes, um, you know, would you guys come down and do this band? And I go, well, what's the band called? It's called Mystery Train. You know, I'm going to put a band called the Mystery Train and, uh, you know, we're going to do a 50-50 split. I'm going to get you a record deal and all this stuff. So we started working together and he goes, wow, you're quite a songwriter. He goes, you know, would you be willing to like write some songs for Kiss? And so I said, yeah, sure, that'd be awesome. That'd be fun. So we we just, more, more than the band, we started writing a lot of music. In fact, if you've got the vault, you've probably seen I've got, I don't know, four or five songs on there. I think the right. first few, other than Gene's songs, yeah, Gene Simmons' the vault. And uh, so anyway, and, you know, he's Gene. I mean, he'll steal whatever he can because he's a businessman. <laughs> and he'll use as much as he can if he can get away with it, whatever. And he'll even laugh at that. And so I'm not saying anything. I don't think he would, you know. But he's a funny guy to hang around, super intelligent, straight-up businessman. It's always business, business business, business, business. But anyway, so Mick Kozowski story though. So back in the same era. So we're actually doing this recording. Mick actually uh, also mixed a Kiss album, I think, right? Um, And uh, speaking of Mick, we're in the studio and Mick just was Mr. Prankster. And he played, um, for whatever reason, Monty Python's Holy Grail had to be on the TV 24 seven. I have no idea. And Life of Brian, like for whatever reason, that was Mick, right? But we're sitting there and he had just finished mixing If I Could Turn Back Time by Cher. And so he had the only DAT master. The, the label had one DAT master he'd sent off, didn't even know if they'd got it yet, right? He, that day, that, that day. And so he had this back then before um, uh, there was a, 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 a digital system called Pro Tools. Uh, before Pro Tools, there was one called Sound Tools. It preceded Pro Tools. So Mick was always been in technology. So he had just bought this new Sound Tools thing. And every key on his keyboard had some gag. Like one was Red's two bar. Yeah, mother wrecking bum. You know, and then, and then there was, you know, Red Rum, Red Rum, Red Rum. Like, so every key had some weird, you know, thing on it, right? And our well-meaning manager, Mike Slar, who was the manager of Bill Ward from Black Sabbath, was managing our band at the time, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, had thought he was going to do us a favor 
uh, on the Magdalene album. So you, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the the song. Um, uh, what was the big ballad we had? Uh, House of Dreams, and we had a, we had a choir on the on the on the on the album. I don't know if you remember that. But anyway, so we were looking for foreigners. I want to know what love is kind of choir. So he found some girls in the post office that were singing in the back of the post office while he's standing in line. And he hires them to be our choir with Mick Gazowski, like mixing. They were so utterly horrific <laughs> that Mick had to take a sound bite of them. And, and so he goes, he's panicking because he has no way to record and digitize this and put it as one of the numer one of the letters on his keyboard is bloody awful, right? So he grabs the original version <laughs> of If I Could Turn Back Time from Cher and erases it and puts the post office girls on top of it just so they can hit the button. Anyway, stupid fun, you know, at the horse oh, horse. <laughs> Fortunately, the label did have the, the, the master. They had the only version. And anyway, crazy, crazy music business stuff. Guys are insane. That yeah, that's nuts. Uh, that could have been really bad. <laughs> I could have had to remix it, you know, but yeah. And well, as long it. as they got the video out of it, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've actually talked to Scott, though. Uh, we, we met him down at the uh, Rock and Pod in Nashville. Oh, awesome. And he talked about, and then we saw, I actually saw him at the Gene Simmons vault too. He, yeah, he, he brought his daughter, he yeah. brought his daughter, I went to Nashville for it and he brought his daughter along to meet Gene. And, uh, cause he was talking about doing unholy and, and working with that. Cause right. he was talking about how Gene was using his little cassette, his little cassette player. Right. And he would like bump these tracks back and right. forth on this old right. portable did, did cassette Did he also player. tell you that he would kind of go, Hey Gene, uh, that's the same lick that you and I came up with, but it's now in Domino. Like, where's my uh... <laughs> Gene? You know, funny thing Gene tried to do. He almost pulled it off. He sends me Federal Express the Vault right to Hawaii, wow. at studio in Hawaii, and then like I think I got a bill for it. I'm like, uh, Gene, you're kidding me, right? Oh, don't worry, I'll take it out of the royalties. What? <laughs> <laughs> That would be Gene. <laughs> that would be Gene. That is funny. That is funny. But anyway, so tell me the Scott thing. So you started to tell me something about Scott. I love Scott. He's awesome. Oh, I just—I was saying we, we we met him down there, and he was talking oh, about okay. it, holy, and all that stuff like that. But Did no, you he's do a, a podcast with him or no? Uh, we we interviewed him at the Rock and Pod. Yeah, right. he's on one of. the – If you listen back to, I um, was it, a couple years ago. We have we have a bunch of uh, short Rock and Pod stuff. And uh, we need There's, to get him back on. No, he's he yeah. answered, so that's why I didn't know if you talked to him before. Or after oh, that, no, no, I yeah. have not. It's been at least uh, well. When did the vault come out? That was what year before last? Something like that. Yeah, the vault was two yeah. years ago. Yeah. I, th yeah. I think the we talked to Scott. That was at the first. Three, one. It was the first one, so that was at least three yeah. years ago. It might have three been. years ago, Ooh. and then I saw him at the vault. Well, it would be four years ago because this year was supposed to be the fourth Rockin' Pod. You're right. So, you're right. Man, yeah. Yeah. man, you blink your eyes and time, time I know time is fast. Yeah. It's crazy. That is so insane. I know you were out there during the volcano. So are you are you now located? Are you still in Hawaii? Or are you out no, of there? No, well, except once I I had four properties there. I had a, a, my house with the studio downstairs, and then I had two really nice homes, all ocean view houses, and then I had a uh, some ocean view land that we would cleared, ready to build on, and then. Madam, you know, Pele decided that she would have none of that. <laughs> and the next thing I know, it's all gone, man. And like, no one took anything out of there. It happened so fast. Wow. It wasn't like, you know, we got a chance to go back and get a truck and get all of our stuff out. Mm -mm. In fact, we hired, we, we went in with, uh, you know, four people in the neighborhood to hire a helicopter to go in just to get some family pictures and a couple things out of the, out of the studio. Uh, we got, every person got 15 minutes to go in and grab something and split. Wow. So. So, I mean, once that was all done, uh, it's all gone now. I mean, basically. Oh, there's it's nothing. Burned. It's all lava. Just yeah. lava. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. You, you couldn't even tell the place ever existed. It was one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. It was amazing. Wow. How sad. So, that was pretty sad. We had insurance. You know, thankfully, like, we got about 80% of our money. I think something like that. So, I mean, it was a bummer. We lost the land completely because you can't insure land. But, um, but at, for the houses, we got most of that back. So. So I was reading too on uh, on on you know, the Wikipedia, of course. You know who who knows how much of that's true. They said you were Sammy Hagar's cousin, so we did get that right. <laughs> uh, you, your movie work and TV work. What so what are you doing? On, what do you do on that? Are you writing music for that? Just yeah. So Wikipedia is a really small snapshot, and and actually so is IMDb. I don't know if you've ever been to sure, IMDb. Yeah, well, whole time uh, now. Internet Movie Database. So um, yeah, I, I think I've done like 
close to a thousand songs for film and television. Cause I took a break from touring when my kids were young. In fact, even down to the journey gig, cause Dean Castronova was an old friend, um, loved Dean, amazing, crazy great singer. Like he's a great drummer and he sounds as good if not better than Steve Perry. It's like, wow. You know, but anyway, um, when uh, Steve had left the band and Ajiri was found doing tracks, like, come on guys, like you didn't know he wasn't doing tracks. Okay. Um, but anyway, so they were looking for another singer and, um, you know, management was shopping around people. And, you know, I was one of those guys and Jeff Scott Soto was one of those guys which they really did him dirty, by the way. But um, anyway, so um, they wanted to go out on the road for like, again, four or five, six months. And I was like, I just realized, you know, my dad left me when I was 13. Yeah, 13 sort of left me to be the man of the house. And it really sucked. You know, he ran away with the secretary. And next thing you know, I'm like, as a kid working two jobs, trying to figure out, you know, finish school. And, you know, it was a bummer. And I just said, you know, I, I love my kids and I'm not going to have them grow them up without a dad. And like all the musicians I knew, all of them were divorced. Every last one of them had gotten a divorce. Nasty. Their kids hated them. You know, and I just didn't want to do that to my kids. In fact, my son has a number one Amazon bestselling book uh, called uh, How to Be an Entrepreneur. And he, it talks about me and still, you know, maintaining the integrity of your home and then still have, running a business. But anyway, so I decided that um, I was going to do music for film and TV. So I did that for 10 years. And, uh, and, and, it, and it got to the point where um, when mp3.com started, the industry started to implode because everyone could get free music. Um, the, the film and TV world, little by little, started, you know, combing MySpace and you know, all these, you know, social media platforms for free music that composers like me that have composed a lot of, you know, I did the theme for Ace Ventura, you know, I did, you know, all these crazy things, um, Baywatch and, you know, all these shows. Um, uh, that, you know, eventually it got to the point where money got less and less and less and less. And you're working harder and harder. And I'm going, I didn't sign on for this. This is kind of like, I, you know, I, I, I was good at first and, you know, it was supporting my family. And then I was working way harder and making a lot less money. So I started a corporate cover band called Ballroom Blitz Cover Band. You go over to yourself to go online, put in Ballroom Blitz Cover Band, and then you'll see Ken Temple, his band I put together. <laughs> because I heard that corporate cover bands were killing it. They were making like... In the high end ones, uh, where where everyone was getting, I don't know, a couple three, couple thousand bucks a night, you know, doing corporate cover gigs. So I set out to put out the quintessential, most amazing cover band in the world. I did it. I I nailed it. You'll see the band, right? And um, and so what happened was this was in 2007. And so I worked the band up, and I got Siemens Medical Convention. I got the Harley Davidson Convention. I got uh. Uh, the Apple convention, I got, you know, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. And then 2008 hit and it was tragically unhip <laughs> to have a, you know, a gala that was, you know, this a big hoorah. So people were taking pictures of the stuff going in and out burger, you know, or whatever as their, their big extravaganza instead of having these big flamboyant, you know, events. Right. And so every last one of them canceled. And wow. I'm like, I had spent a year and a half of my life putting this together and now there's like it the rug was just like COVID for a lot of people right now, right? It was pulled out from under me. So I wound up going, well, gosh, you know, I don't want to tour, at least if I do not more than like a month at a time. And I can't the film and TV business is just in the toilet. Plus that they're all the morons that were the A&R people I couldn't stand from the music industry somehow made it over to be music supervisors in the film and TV industry. And I said, okay, well, I have an incredible knowledge of singing. I've got a master's in voice and I'm, you know, just yeah, I'm really, you know, I'm studying under the world's greatest vocal coaches. You know, maybe I'll just invite people to a singing academy, you know, why not? So I took the camera that I bought for making the video of the Ballroom Blitz band. I put it in my living room. I sang some crazy blues lick. And the next thing I know, I'm on Jimmy Fallon. And the rest is history. Like it just wow. like, you know, exploded into this singing academy, you know? So we have, we have tens of thousands of, of students right now. Tens of thousands. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. So if a person, I mean, even if you have no vocal ability whatsoever, you can you can teach them to, I mean, is there somebody, I mean, is there, somebody, is there, is there an unteachable person? <laughs> if you can sing happy birthday, you can learn how to sing. Straight up. If you can sing happy birthday, are the people so tone deaf that, you know, yeah, her name's Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> 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 Did I say that? 
<laughs> well, I'm glad you did. That's funny. <laughs> but, I mean, there are those people, um, and they can find their way. I mean, come on, let's face it. You're going to have to zip somebody. It may be the devil. It may be the devil, <laughs> but you're going to have to zip somebody. You know, even Bob Dylan is arguably maybe the most influential songwriter that's ever lived. Right. And people say, really? Really? Google right now, whenever you get a chance, and just put in Google search artists that have covered Bob Dylan's music, and you're oh, going to go. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Everybody from Adele to Ministry to Lionel Richie to, I mean, I don't care who it is. It's unbelievable. And yet he can't really sing to save his life, right? right. So. It just depends on what you mean by singing and it's about what you mean by artistry and what you mean by influencing people with your, your songs and music and you know, whatever, you know, right. I mean, and you know, I mean, Southern man, and, uh, you know, I'm like, <laughs> not make a lot of people hating, hating on me right now, but if it's, if you're, looking, <laughs> you're looking at a lot of people, you know, you know, getting back to what you said earlier though, Bill's, Bill's got his mute. <laughs> he was going, yeah. <laughs> no, I tell you what though, I, you know, we went and saw, actually, we saw Tony Bennett this, this past winter. Uh -huh. He's 93 years old. Wow. And that wow. dude still. Wow. I mean, he's, he's not, he's not like he was back in his fifties or forties, right. but for 93 years old, I was entertained and just was, I was, I just wow. had a and big smile. That's Tom Jones. Look at that guy, oh, man. Yeah. Look out, you know, oh. amazing. So oh, it's goodness. also proof that you can hang on to it to those years. Everybody thinks, oh, when you're 50, that's it. You're done or earlier, right? But it's just not true. Yeah. You know, it's not true. Look it at depends us. On, but, but I think to your point, though, and, you're, and, and, you know, part of the reason we're having the conversation, it really depends on how you take care of yourself. I mean, yeah. there's some really great vocalists out there that were out there that now they can't do it. And it's, they didn't take care of themselves. They got you know, that or they had medical issues. I mean, think Paul Stanley. Paul Stanley. I mean, we, well, Paul Stanley was one of our favorite. I mean, he was a. He was still one of the greatest front men. The other night, I was laying in bed, and I, I, I pulled up on my iPad that I'm still loving you, or, or, or I still love you. I, I was one of those. For, I was made for loving you. No, I, I still love you. That oh, from sorry, Preachers. Yeah, I, that's right. That was the, that was the, that was the, the Blondie ripoff was I was right. made for that's <laughs> but I was listening to it. I was sitting there and I told Kelly, I said, this is when Paul could sit. Cause this was during that, that the, the, the official conventions that they had. Right. And it was just a raw track. I said, this is when Paul could really sing, you know, yeah. we, we, you know, I went to the three of the farewell tours till it got shut down, you know, and of course he's backtracking. You can tell he, I mean, cause when he's talking, it's like, <laughs> and he starts singing and it's like, it's perfect. It's like, right. dude, it's a track. It's you know? a bummer. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's I early. I but he, he but he had that surgery and after that surgery that was it you know it was that wasn't nothing done on. I'm sure he took care of himself it just yeah I mean he didn't drink or, or do any drugs he or or uh, gene they they're drug free and alcohol free so um you know it's amazing because uh, he you know he looks like an in shape kind of guy but he didn't take of his take care of his voice itself I had I had a conversation uh, with Tommy about that like I don't know five six years ago I think it was before surgery. And I said, we can't, we could rehabilitate his voice, dude. We can do this, you know? And then he just, it's, you know, kiss has their own way of doing things and it sure. is what it is. And this is where they are. So, sure. okay. and Tommy's a really cool guy. I love Tommy, man. He's a really straight up dude. Well, Tommy is funny. A lot of people. Yeah. Tommy, like during those conventions, I remember going to, I went to the one in Nashville and the one in Indy and, you know, Tommy was, you know, setting up microphones, running cords, getting coffee. He's been, right. he's been in the organization. I mean, he, if anybody deserves to wear that makeup, he is, he is because he has worked that company from, from being a gopher to working on all the, the videos and doing all the mic, you know, all that stuff and putting that stuff together to, you know, basically, you know, he's, he's earned his way, you know, and, it, and, and Eric, you know, of course he's just a great drummer. So he's, he, he deserves it too. He's yeah. been in there for a long time. Yeah. So, so Ken, I had a question for you too. So the, the, you know, there's been a lot of replacement singers over time of some of those great bands from the eighties that we love and stuff like that. Is there, is there anybody that you think the replacement singer was better than the original or as good as the original? Well, we just talked about Sam and Van Halen's very, very different. Um, I don't, you know, you know, what's really, in, let's talk about this first, that one part of this. And, you know, if Sam hears this, he might think, oh, I never thought of it that way, you know, and I never communicate with him. So we're not like close or anything. Um, and it's, 
when I think of Van Halen and why there's such a split camp on Van Halen is because the original Van Halen was the ultimate amazing garage band. Hear me out on this. It was the guitar lick driven, like ACDC. So it was guitar hero, guitar lick driven. And I don't mean lead. I'm talking guitar rhythm, guitar lick driven music with party written all over it. Okay. Right. It's a party. So, you know, David was the party. Eddie was the, was the garage band guitar lick guy. And that's what made the band. Now, how interesting that when Sam joined the band, the party kind of went away, became a corporate, you know, corporate song from a songwriting standpoint. I'm not saying the live shows, but from a songwriting standpoint, became very corporate, very, um, you know, radio friendly. Everything was all about, you know, writing that song and this and that, whatever. And how strange that both camps came. Sam was a party guy, too. He was the Ford truck, back of the Ford truck, Mas Tequila guy. I mean, you know, really? I mean, before that, right? Guy can't drive 55. So he was a champion of, you know, middle America party in a different kind of way. And so, but how strange that both worlds came together, collided, came together, became so stiffly corporate. It was really weird. So on the one hand, he kicked David's ass from here to kingdom come as a singer, but he, they lost the original intent and what the original fans loved about Van Halen. And that's why there's such a split camp on them that, you know, now, now in fairness though, that decision of taking it corporate from a songwriting standpoint catapulted them way beyond any of the, the, the singles and any of the, you know, the original <laughs> selling, uh, you know, album selling thing that the original Van Halen did. So I'd certainly say Sam. Now, um, believe it or not, we just talked about, and he didn't get the gig, but I got to say, man, if you go look at Dean Castronova, I don't know if you've done this or not, but do yourself a favor, look up mother, father, you know, uh, uh, look up, uh, faithfully some of the original stuff that Dean sang on when he's buying the drum set. I was like, wow, dude, better than Steve. Wow. Straight up. Now, he didn't actually, you know, they did like a year's worth of tour, eight months worth of tour with him doing it that way. And they said, well, we need someone to front the band, <laughs> not someone behind. I would say Phil Collins when he stepped out from behind the drums and Peter Gabriel. I love Peter Gabriel. Sledgehammer's cool. Look at what Phil Collins came, went on to do. I mean, right? So but that's pretty few and far between. So a lot of the replacements, like when I forgot what his name is, it's just recently passed, God rest his soul, but, you know, tried to replace Paul Rogers in Bad Company. Bad mistake. Oh yeah, <laughs> Brian yeah. Howe. There's yeah. Rogers. Brian Howe. Yeah. And then and then, and by the way, I'm not bagging on anybody. You're just asking an honest question, and giving an honest answer. Yeah. Um, right. Is you know Adam Lambert? Come on, really replacing you know Freddie and everyone saying oh you know he's like the incarnation? No, he's not. No, not even close. And he can't write like Freddie. He can't sing like Freddie. He doesn't have same emotion. He might have his a couple licks down, and he has some range, and it's cool. And I'm not dissing Adam. It's just don't, don't, don't say he's Freddie. You know what I mean? No, what about what Christmas. about Mark Martell though? I would say, dude, you should have taken Mark. See, that's <laughs> that's my that's my thing. When I when I saw him, What's when I saw his. But but yeah. let's 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 LGBTQ this out a bit. There's reasons people get gigs, oh. and and it's not always just the talent. So, you know, there's that. And again, I'm trying to be, you know, walk the line here. I'm not trying to, like, everybody's got their thing or whatever. But in fairness, Mark absolutely would have killed it. You he know? would have. Absolutely. But it killed it. People yeah. would have just gone, wow, holy cow, Freddie lives. <laughs> you know? So um, I'm trying to think of anybody else. You know, no one could replace Brad Delp. I mean, no one can replace, like, these guys were crazy. I mean, and, and okay, so maybe one of the closest Guys, I think John Elefante did a great job stepping in for Steve Walsh and those years. Was he as good as Steve? I don't think so. But he did his own thing really cool. And they did write, you know, Fight Fire with Fire. And some of those songs were a really good song. Wasn't quite the Kansas, Steve Walsh, Kansas. But it was respectable. You know, he stepped into it into and did a respectable job. Um, I mean, is there anybody else you guys could think of? Give well, me I was... I, you know what came to mind, and, and I, I watched one of your um, uh, where you take somebody, one of the current artists like Sammy, and what makes the, what makes the singer the great series, right? Um, that you do, and um, I watched the Lou Graham one, and I was thinking about Kelly Hansen because I I never got to see Foreigner with Lou Graham, but 
so my foreigner really is Kelly Hansen. But okay. when I listen to the when I listen to the records and I listen to you know it. There's no, there's not a terrible I mean a huge amount of difference between the two of them at least to my you know to my dumb ears you know like Lou is probably my greatest vocal influence straight up more than Coverdale Lou Graham is probably you listen to me singing and you go wow there's a lot of Lou Graham in that guy right um, but there's two parts to this the first part is is imitation versus originality um, when I think of Lou Graham. I, I, Kelly to me is about 75% of Lou Graham. Okay. Now I remember Kelly way back in hurricane days. I was in Joshua and we weren't, you know, we would did shows together, the Roxy and the Troubadour and all these, you know, the country club, these different, you know, venues or whatnot. And, um, you know, Kelly has always been a great singer and it's very hard stuff. And look, Kelly, I think is last technically kind of like, you know, when you think of Tommy Thayer, you know, being outlasting Ace Freely, Tommy's done the band way longer than Ace ever did the band. And ever thinks of Kisses, you know, Ace Freely and, you know, you, you know, Peter Chris, you know, that was the lineup and then everybody else are imposters. But um, so when I think of Kelly, you know, later on, he did have done a fabulous job of stepping into the foot, you know, in, into the, uh, you know, the position of, of Lou Graham. But man, when you hear why I want to love is, and you hear, you know, um, you know, you know, I mean, I just think of, you know, uh, uh, Lou's just got that rah, straight up. <laughs> Kelly, would be, Kelly would be, I would climb any mountain. He'd be kind of like that on the sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, that's fair. There's yeah. a there's a there's a difference to me in the soul of it, and and there's a, by the way, you know, there's another part to this too that it's worthy of bringing up. People, you know, there. Let's take Jimi Hendrix, okay, as a guitar player. So people, you know, they worship Jimi Hendrix, and let's face it, Jimi Hendrix wasn't that great of a guitar player. But the innovation of what Jimi Hendrix did was, right. it, it withstood the test of time, and everyone worships Jimi Hendrix. Now, a lot of people could come behind that, and a lot of people could do it a lot better. I mean, you know, I heard a Bossa Nova, uh, uh, Joe Bossa Nova, B B Bonamassa, excuse me, sorry, Joe, uh, Bonamassa thing, and he was just like crushing it, like, wow, you know? But let's face it, Hendrix did it first. It's Hendrix. And then there's Joe, and Joe does everything he does is amazing. But it's still not Hendrix, and it still doesn't quite sound like Hendrix, you know? Uh, so here you have Joe, who's technically a thousand times greater than Hendrix could have ever been, but there's Hendrix. And then there's Joe doing Hendrix, right? It is what it is. Even at that level, it's it it is what it is. So, well, you know, so I'm trying to think of being honest about people that actually stepped into roles. And what Sammy did was cool because he did Sammy, not not you know not David. But go ahead, you're gonna ask yeah. something. Well, you no. know, you know, you brought up that Jimi Hendrix wasn't that great of a guitar player. I've always felt that way. I mean, I respect what came of what he did, but I never have been that big of a Hendrix fan. And I think a lot of the reason that he is held in such a high regard is because he died so young. I, yeah, I believe absolutely. if he had lived, you know, him or Jim Morrison, you know, they all would have hit that thing and then just straight down. And Janice is the same thing. And everyone, Janice, job, but Janice, job, Janice. Yep. Like, Come on, guys. Okay, I get it. You know, give me a little piece of my heart. Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and then you listen to Susan Tedeschi and she says, you know, that's one of my biggest influences. And, and then you hear, you know, Christina Aguilera sing Etta James. Right? Okay, <laughs> Etta is Etta, and that's great. She did it last. I get it. But really, the greatest? We call it the greatest? I don't know, man. Aretha was throwing down pretty stinking hard in those days. <laughs> I am not worthy, you know. So I want to give credit where credit's due. And and so Janice was Janice. She inspired a lot of people. And she did it first, I guess, sort of. Um, there were still other people, you know, at the time doing stuff like that. But um, was she that great? No. No. You know, was Etta that great? No. Was Aretha that great? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, was Stevie Wonder that great? Yes. Stevie's yeah. that great. You know, <laughs> there are guys that are just that great. Are there other guys? And, and so there's this weird sort of hype that happens. And. Uh, you, all right, I'm going to get major hate for this. It is what it is. We just talked about Freddie Mercury. Is Freddie 
the greatest singer that's ever lived, or Axl Rose for that matter. Well, go ahead. I'm going to take, I might as well go ahead and, and cut off my nose despite my face. Not an Axl oh, fan. No. No. <laughs> no, they really weren't. They really I'm a Freddie. I'm a Freddie fan, hey, but Freddie wrote Freddie wrote great music. Freddie was insane in the composition department. Right. Insane in the composition department. Well, and just, Freddie also incorporated a lot of different styles into his music. I've got to be cool. Uh, relax. And he's going to an Elvis thing one minute. And he's doing a theatrical thing over here, a rock opera thing over here, and then he's doing you know tire mother down. So like there was all these different elements. What made Freddie great was his diverseness. Very flamboyant, the Liberace of you know, love and exactly. right? Yeah. And 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 he he was an an unbelievable front man, but to and his vibrato was way out of control. He was pitchy as hell. He never sang all the notes live. I don't care what anyone says. I saw him seen eight, nine, ten times every day. You know, I, it, but I was. But again, we go back to this thing. Did I was I so worried about him hitting the one note in Bohemian Rhapsody or whatever? You know, no. It was you know I went to go see Queen and it was awesome. And I would go back every time they would play. Um, that I had access to go seeing them. So now it's also interesting that there are these people that made it to this icon status, the Freddies, Sebastian Bach. Come on, guys, no offense, but we actually made fun of him back in the day. He, <laughs> does, he has a lot of range. He was cute as heck, and the girls loved him. But his pitch was off the charts horrible and whenever we saw him live we all went down there you know how many guitar players <laughs> screw in a light bulb kind of thing one you know for a singer just one because the whole re world revolves around him and guitar players is 90 <laughs> it takes it takes only 99 because there's one and 99 say i can do that better that's a guitar player um but anyway so but, but getting back to, and i'm not dissing these people i'm gonna say who the hell do you think you're you know, oh, i'm just ken tamplin but i'm being honest and if people were really really honest with themselves they go, yeah. So I want to get back to the Queen thing. So, by the way, Sebastian Bach. So in that time, let's do the math of this. We had Tony Harnell killing it. We had, uh, you know, um, Steelheart. You know, we had, you know, killing it. We had, you know, Tesla killing it. We had Cinderella killing it. We had Winger killing it. I mean, I had to just dope down all these bands that were killing it. And then there was... Sebastian Bach, and they were like a little bit above poison as far as like the whole, you know, thing in the band, right? And and so, you know, that which leads me, don't get me started. <laughs> but let, let's go back to Queen. So in an argument with Freddie, and if, and, and if, I don't know if he'd ever admit this to this day, but I remember this way back in the day, it was in Rolling Stone magazine, and Freddie was in a beef with Brian May over Brian, because at the time they 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 looked up to Bad Company. This was pre, this is way back in the day. They were looking up to Bad Company and Brian says, we need to be more like Bad Company. We need to be more like Paul Rogers. And and Freddie says, I know effing Paul Rogers. I'll never be like that. I can never do that. Wow. Think about that. Freddie's saying, I can never be Paul Rogers. So now Freddie went on and, you know, the world embraces certain things for their reasons, if you know what I mean. And he went on in, you know, the Freddie infamy of Freddie Mercury. And no one even knows who Paul Rogers is anymore. Sadly. No one knows who Lou Graham is anymore. Sadly. And it wasn't for David Coverdale's 80s run that he had was still of the night. You know, this is this love and, you know, whatever. No one would know who David Coverdale is. Yet these guys were like, Wow. Ronnie James Dio exactly. thankfully sort of made it a little bit past that icon status. I'll eventually get their movie out about him, you know, whatnot. But these guys were monsters. Glenn Hughes, you know, monsters. I mean, these are monsters of metal. And then, and then, so like I was on a label, Music for Nations, in, out of the UK. And on that label, uh, you know, they had Motorhead. I think Motorhead was on there. They had um, Poison. Uh, you know, uh, Striper was on there, other, other, these other uh, bands or whatnot. And it was interesting because people at the time were trying to lump Motorhead in with Poison and like these other bands. <laughs> Guys, there's one Lemmy. And, and by the way, I'm not even a swearing man, but the book, you've talked about Dave Grohl and what's his name that wrote the book. You know, what is it? What is it? Uh, 49% motherfucker, 51% son of a bitch, or whatever. <laughs> that was the name of the book, or whatever. And I'm going, 
they're right. Lemmy was the real deal. And I can't tell. So I'm doing this show. I'm in, um, you know, so as others are trying to pit them in like, you know, the only thing that ever came good out of Poison, as far as I'm concerned, was Richie Cotton, you know, but and that was later. But hey, little bug, you want to come say, I'm, I'm actually on, I'm on a, I'm on a podcast. You want to see how I'm here real quick? My grandson's here. Come say hi. Oh, yeah. sure. This is my grandson, Zion. Zion. Hey, love man. And I love him like crazy. <laughs> he's actually the guy with the strat that's over there and the, and the, the Marshall cabinet that's over here. That's his. Oh. We got it for Christmas. So we're going to start throwing down. Yeah, I'll be up there in a bit. So tell, tell Gigi I'll be up there and I love you and I'll see you in a bit. Yeah, almost. Um, yeah, I will. Just a little bit. <laughs> I told my play with him later. Um, anyway, <laughs> so um, getting back to Lemmy. So, you know, uh, it, was in, it was in Shao and uh, – or Tamplin. I think it was in Shao. And um, – I'm doing this uh, MTV show, and they're they're you know Lemmy was actually the the MC, and we uh, and the reason they had him doing shout is we were gonna play a couple of shows with him like in in like in the north somewhere I have to think where it was but anyway all I remember is um, he'd have this cut on his arm from like here to here and it was pretty fresh and pretty gnarly, and I'm like dude you know I'm backstage I go what happened. And he goes, oh, bloody hell, mate. <laughs> it's one thing when they throw the change at you. That's the son of a bitch. But when they piss in the, piss in the leader and they break it on the stage and they throw it at you and they cut you from here to here, that <laughs> bitch. And he goes, but I still finished the show. Comes back <laughs> out, <clears throat> they cut an artery. So I'm pissing a bottle and a pint, broke it, threw it on stage, bottle hit him in the arm, cut him. He bled through the whole show, barely made it to the doctor, and they sewed his butt up, and they, you know, whatever. And then a few days later, he's like, already on back on stage with me and, like, doing this thing. And the word bot. So the first show I do with him is in some, like, biker bar in the north of, of England with a, a, a mesh fence around us. <laughs> He's like, throwing everything, and God, from here to kingdom come at you. And I guess that's supposed to be, like, a sign of them liking you or something, <laughs> you know, and I found out too that the reason he sings like this, did you hear the story on that one? Uh-uh. So I said, Hey, look, I go, that's really bad vocal health. This is way before I was ever doing, you know, you know, I go, why do you like, I mean, it's really constricting. You cut off the trachea, you cut off the wind supply and said, whatever. He goes, Oh, it's, a, it's, it's quite the story, mate. He says, we played a lot of bar bands in the day. And, you know, I, I, Every time a, a, a brutal, bloody bar fight would break out. He says, but you got to know, mate, the show must go on. The show must go on. So I developed that. So it's the fists were flying and the beer bottles were coming and the chairs were breaking. We could still play, mate. And they could go in and the bar fight would go on and they play. So he did it to protect himself from flying objectiles. <laughs> 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 that is hilarious man all right this has been fun man this has been fun we're getting at about an hour hour and that's about where we usually stay keep this at at an hour ken you've been a you've been a trip been a joy this conversation with you all right well before we go before we go won't you pimp all your stuff you where you, where people can find you and well, they can go just there. go to ken tamplin vocal and check me out the easiest thing to do is to go to YouTube and then type in the search bar, Ken T-A. Don't even spell my last name, Ken T-A. And in the search bar will come up, Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy. And just click on it and just enjoy some music, you know? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, a, I'm not Gene. I'm not going to sit here and, <laughs> and sell you. What, what Gene Sims, my favorite Gene Simmons thing. We're going to close with this one. So anyway, Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy. If you want to learn how to sing, if you're already an experienced singer, I, I really can dial you into some amazing stuff. But it, a closing with Gene story, Simmons story. So, so I'm with Gene, and we're at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and there's a bar area there. And we're waiting for this publisher to come down uh, to uh, for for a uh, mystery train. And so, uh, so Gene, which was surprising because he never does this, reaches for the check. <laughs> and um, anyway, and he whips out a Kiss credit card, and so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no joke. And so Michael Levine, who was the the the, uh, the guy that we were waiting for, comes. It was that kind of came down. And he goes, "I thought you said you were like diametrically opposed to doing anything on credit. 
what are you doing with a KISS credit card? He says, well, you know, if you're going to whip it up, you might as well look cool doing it. <laughs> that is, that is, ladies that, and gentlemen. That, he, pro- he probably got a percentage on that, too, somehow. Yeah. You know? I had a, I had a oh, KISS yeah. credit, I had a Kiss Kiss credit card, card, for sure. Yeah. I, also ha- I still have my KISS credit card. I still have mine, too. <laughs> I don't have one. I don't have one. I can drink the stay. Kool-Aid. <laughs> All right. Ken, stay All around, right. Ken, stay around here for just Talk one minute. Back. If you don't care, stay around for just a second. Alan, you want to take us out? Visit us on 80sofrock.com. Check out our social media and our past episodes. And until next time, peace out, people. Thanks for listening to the Ages of Rock podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and most importantly, tell all your friends. Remember, you're never too old to rock. Until the next episode, peace out, folks.